So again, in Luke 14, uh, we're going to be looking at verses 12 through 24. And this is going into the parable of the great banquet. And before we get into the parable itself, I want to do a little bit of background. Let's kind of set the stage, the setting, the context of what's going on here. And, and throughout Jesus' ministry, he's been teaching the Jews. He's been teaching the, the religious leaders uh, in, in that community primarily. And, and I think a big thing of, of what Jesus is trying to do is really switch up their mindset from, from the here and now, from the temporal to the eternal. Because they were so focused on, on the things that were here and now, like the law of God and the traditions and all these things. And, and Jesus, knowing that he was the fulfillment of those things, was trying to get them to understand who he was. And, and he would teach them these things. And, and he saw through religious leaders and the hypocrisy that they had where they would judge others for things that they themselves would be doing. And, and Jesus knows the heart. So he's seeing right through that stuff. No matter how we try to portray ourselves to others, he sees the heart. So he, he's been doing this ministry and he's been teaching a lot in parables. And we know that Jesus teaches in parables, one, to the people who want to know the truth. It, it reveals the truth in, in such an incredible way. But to those who don't care about the truth, it, it further reveal or, or conceals that truth from them. So here Jesus is teaching another parable. And we get into verse 12. Uh, but you'll see at the beginning of chapter 14, if you look at 14.1, we'll see the context. We'll see the setting of where Jesus uh, currently is. It says in verse 1, On the Sabbath, when he went to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. So we see here that he was in the house of a Pharisee, he was in the house of a ruler of a Pharisee, and he probably had many other Pharisees that were dining with him, and they were watching him carefully. They were constantly keeping their eyes on him. We good? All right. <laughs> we could just let that preach the sermon today. So they're, they're keeping their eyes on him. They're watching him. So you have the leader of the Pharisees. Jesus is dining with them. He's teaching with them. And I think that like a lot of the interactions that Jesus had with the Pharisees, they were kind of uh, awkward. You know, because Jesus was calling a spade a spade. He was calling them out on the hypocrisy. He was calling them out on so many of these things. And they didn't want to hear it. So there was a lot of silence, even at this meal where Jesus was calling him out on these things, and he asked him a few questions. In the first 11 verses, you'll see, he asked him a few questions, and they're silent. They don't want to answer Jesus, so they're silent. So now we get into the verses that we're going to read, and Jesus switches gears here. He's no longer addressing these people that are at the table, and he switches his focus right on to the head of the household, the one who had invited him. So we see in 12, it says, He, Jesus, said also to the man who had invited him, When you give a dinner or a banquet, kind of similar to what we're doing right now. He says, When you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. And again, I think that this was one of those moments where there was some tension in the air because, let's, let's be honest, the guy's probably looking around at Jesus when Jesus is talking to him, and he's not seeing any of the people that Jesus told him he should have invited. Rather, he's seeing all the people, most likely, that Jesus told him he should not have invited. And it's not, it's not a bad thing to have a banquet and invite friends and family. It's not what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about religious hypocrisy, where here you have these people who were so high and mighty, and they were so close to God, and they followed the law, and they did all these things. And Jesus is saying, you think that you're so holy? Well, then why are you doing this? If you invite these people, you're going to be repaid. If you want to be blessed... Don't invite the same crowd. Invite these people, the unclean people, the people you would never imagine inviting. Invite them. So I think it was one of those moments that there was probably some more tension. 
And now we pick up in verse 15. I think one of the friends maybe dining there kind of interjects on behalf of the person who uh, is running the house, the one who invited the guests. He says, when one of those who reclined at the table with him heard these things. So he's kind of hearing Jesus, you know, make this statement. And again, it's uncomfortable. He's kind of calling out the master of the house here. He said to him, he says to Jesus, well, blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Blessed is everyone, Jesus, who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. See, Jesus was telling him, you're doing all these things, but if you, if you change it up and if you do these other things, stop doing it the way you've been doing it and truly do it the way that I would tell you to do it, then you will be blessed. And his friend's kind of saying, you know, Jesus, I know you're telling him that, but we're blessed anyway. Blessed is all who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Jesus, you know who we are? We're the Pharisees. We're, we're the religious people. We're the ones who are close to God. And we'll all be blessed because we will be eating bread in the kingdom of God. And I think this is the platform that compels Jesus to give this parable. Where these people are so certain, we're blessed. We're going to be eating at, at the banquet of God. And Jesus is saying, well, let me give you a parable. Let me give you a parable because I want you to rethink just how confident you are in your religion and maybe your relationship with God. So he goes on and gives them this parable. We're going to pick up in 16. So Jesus is now responding to this man. He says, but he said to him, a man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the time for the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, come for everything is now ready. But they all alike begin to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a field and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to the master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to the servant, Go out quickly to the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. And the servant said, Sir, what you commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and the hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. So I think one important thing we have to understand is in Middle Eastern culture today, as it was in Jesus's day, the idea of customs and courtesies, this was a a big deal. And hospitality being one of those customs and courtesies was one of the biggest. All right. So when he's talking about a banquet and invitations, things like that, like when I was in Iraq, if someone you go into the house of an Iraqi and he offers you tea, you don't ever reject that tea, even if you don't want it. It's part of the hospitality to reject the tea is to reject that person. And same in this context, that to reject the invitation would to be to reject the master altogether. So it's a, it's a big deal. I think in, in the United States, we kind of have no problem making plans and breaking plans and just doing things the way we want to do them. But in those cultures, it's a big, big deal. So we have to understand those things. Now, who were the original people? Who, who were the people that Jesus is talking about when he sent, when the invitation was initially sent out? Well, I believe that the Bible is pretty clear that, that Jesus' listeners would have understood this to be the Jews. The Jewish people were the ones who received the initial invitation from God. Now, you, you find, because his listeners would have known what God told Moses to tell the people in Exodus 19.5. He said, If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples. And in Deuteronomy 14, 2, he says, For you are a holy people to the Lord your God, and the Lord has chosen you to be a people for his own possession, out of all of the peoples who are on the face of the earth. 
Now, Paul would have been very familiar with this, this concept as well, and he tells us in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, this, the invitation, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile, first to the Jew, then to everyone else. So this is important to know who it was, the recipients of this, this first invitation. And I think that Jesus' audience, the people that sat with him, would have known that. And I, I believe that their very position as, as Jews, uh, it was a great blessing from God, but it also became a great stumbling block. Because they started to think, you know, we have this position with God. We were born into this, this uh, lineage, this heritage. We are the people of God. And we have the customs of God. We have the law of God. We have all these things of God that were blessings. But then they started to focus always on the blessings rather than on the God who gave them those blessings. And it became all about who they were in, in their birthright and in their customs and in their rituals. And they forgot about God. It had nothing to do with that relationship anymore. So because of who they were as Jews, I think it became their stumbling block. And that's why Jesus was coming in again to usher this kingdom into them and, and let them know that he was the fulfillment of these things. See, relationship had nothing to do with their, their religion. And I think that that's so true of many of us today where where we get so focused on the religious aspects. I have to go to church. I go to church on Sunday. Why do you go to church on Sunday? Well, because it's, it's, I'm supposed to do it. Do you come to church on Sunday to worship God, to, to bring Him praise and glory because you have a relationship with Him? Because if you, if you don't have a relationship and you're trusting in all these other things, religious practices, and maybe your standing or your position, and, and you think because you know of Jesus that somehow that will help you. Well, this is what a lot of the Jews believed in. And Jesus told them in Luke 13, 24 through 27, He told them, Strive to enter through the narrow door. He says, for many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen and shut the door and you begin to stand outside and to knock at the door saying, Lord, open to us. Then he will answer you, I do not know where you come from. He will answer, I, I don't know you then you'll begin to say, but Lord, we ate and drank in your presence and, and we even listened to you teach in the streets. You know us. You know us. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. See, sometimes we we get caught up in this idea of maybe because I serve in this ministry or I do that and I do this and I fill a lot of my time with things that I consider good, that that makes me a good person. So I don't necessarily have to have this thing that people are talking about, this, this relationship with God. I don't really have to submit myself to Him. I, I check these boxes and I do these things and I'm a good person. I start to look at the people that aren't really doing as much as I'm doing Okay? And, and I start to compare myself with them, and I start to think, you know what? The banquet would actually be lacking if I wasn't there. That, that banquet needs me. And once you start to think that you are deserving of the invitation, the invitation loses so much of its significance. When you start to think that that invitation should come to me, that, that should be mine. Now this invitation in those days would have been twofold. There's two parts to the way that you invite. I guess similar to maybe the way we do today, we, we do an initial invitation, like an RSVP to this party. So there would have been an initial invitation that went out to all the people who were invited to the banquet. And then when it was time for the banquet, another servant would go out and tell all those same people who were invited, it's time. The banquet is set, the food is ready, the table is prepared, the time to come is right now. 
The time to come is right now. Stop what you're doing. It's time to come. And I see this beautiful correlation between the Jews receiving this invitation all throughout their history. They, they knew that it's almost like they had this open invitation to dine in the kingdom of God. Okay, But now Jesus was here. You see, where he comes in, in, in verse 17, it says, At the time for the banquet, he sent his servant to say the time is now to come. So Jesus is here now, and he's saying, you've always had this invitation. I am the fulfillment of that invitation. The banquet is ready. The kingdom of God has come. The time is right now. The time is right now. But how do they respond? What is, what is the response? Is this invitation. Maybe they were waiting for it the whole time, but then there were things that got in the way or things that come up. So they have an invitation to the banquet. The time to come to the banquet is now. And we see in verse 18, but they all alike begin to make excuses. They begin to make excuses why it's not a good time for them. You know, one person bought a field. He has to go inspect it. Another has some oxen. He has to go and check them out, make sure that, that they're able to work the field. And then you have another person who got married. And, and he's got his own celebrations to attend. He, he can't really be uh, required to, to meet this other obligation and come. And I think the only way that that is possible for people to make up the excuses is they do not understand the gravity of the invitation. They don't understand the eternality of the banquet. See, it's not that important, and maybe it's because they think they're deserving of an invitation, or maybe it's just all these other things that are getting into their heads as to why they don't need to go to the banquet, but that's all irrelevant. They have all of these excuses that seem good to them, but at the end of the day, they're just excuses. And the only way you can make an excuse not to dine at the table of the master is if you don't really get what that means. You're not really letting it sink in. You don't really understand the significance of the fact that you would be invited to come and dine. And I think that that was the problem. They didn't find it significant. So it wasn't a problem for them to say, I, I have other things going on. And I think in their mind, those things were significant. I mean, think about it. I bought a field. I got some oxen. I just got married. You got some work things. You've got some relational things. Aren't those kind of the get out of ministry free cards that we give to each other? Right? Well, you haven't been to church in a year. Well, what's been going on? Well, I had some work obligations. Oh, no big deal. I understand. But these are all excuses. And, and no matter how much they rationalized them in their mind, when it got back to the master, what was his response? We find his response in verse 21, and through the rest of the, the chapter, or excuse me, 21 through 24. So the servant came and reported these things to the master. All these fantastic excuses. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, Go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the poor and the crippled and blind and lame. And the servant said, Sir, what you commanded has been done. And still there is room. And the master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. This is a pretty profound thing that, that Jesus would, would say, that the master would completely switch gears here. And it's this contrast between these, these people who felt themselves to be deserving of this invitation, and because they felt maybe themselves to be so deserving that they easily rejected the invitation. So now it goes to these people that you have to understand in Jesus' day, if you were lame, if you were blind, if you were crippled, it wasn't just poor you. The, the predominant thought was that it had something to do with your sin or your parents' sin. If you were blind or lame or you were poor, then that had everything to do with something that you screwed up, you violated God's law, and now He's punishing you for that. So not only if you were blind would you be blind, 
but you're also unclean. So to have the gospel or, or the invitation go out to these types of people would have been unheard of. How could these types of people, these unclean people, and then not only them, it goes out, outside of the city to everyone, where it's saying gather everyone and compel everyone to come in so that my banquet will be filled. So now it's going outside of Judaism. Now the word, the invitation is going to go outside to everyone that can't be. But that's exactly what the master does. He says, if, if you're not going to take it, and maybe it's because you think you're so deserving of it, I'm going to send it out to those people who would never expect it. That when the invitation comes to them, they say, no, 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 you have it all wrong. I, I, I think this is a mix-up. You're inviting me to the master's banquet. Like this invitation is for me to come and dine with him. And they say, of course I'll come. Are you sure it's not a mix-up? No, I'm really invited. Of course, of course I will come to the banquet. And they say, well, wait, 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 didn't you just buy a field? I don't care about that field. Didn't, but didn't you just buy some ox? You need them to work your land? I don't care about that ox. I thought you just got married. That woman can wait. <laughs> because I am going to the banquet. There, there's, there's nothing that would even come close to being as significant or as relevant or as important on the here and now when you understand the significance of the invitation. So the invitation was sent out to those who would see how magnificent it is. See, Jesus is reclining with these religious people. And, and he's telling them, Listen, th this is what you need to understand. I think you, you feel pretty confident that you will be eating bread in the kingdom of God. But this is what you have to understand now that I am here. Is that you, the Jews, receive the invitation. The invitation has been given to you, but I am the fulfillment of that invitation. He's looking them in the eyes. I am the fulfillment of that invitation. And if you reject me then you reject the invitation. And if you reject the invitation, then you will never eat at my table. And the message, the invitation, has not changed today. It is exactly the same. Jesus is telling you and me that the invitation has been given to us. You sitting here today, you have been invited you have been invited now you have to understand that Jesus is the fulfillment of that invitation and if you reject Jesus then you reject the invitation and if you reject the invitation you will never dine at his table do you understand the significance of what Jesus is saying here do you get the weightiness of this message? Because the invitation is for us to come back to God, to be reconciled to God, to spend eternity with Him. And to accept the invitation is to believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. To accept that invitation is to start to get real with ourselves and say, you know, I have a lot of reasons why I don't want to believe in the invitation. I, I think that, that I really am a good person. But if you get real with yourself and you start to think, if I was to stand before a perfect and holy and righteous God, the one that can see through the facade that I put on to everyone else, but can really see all the skeletons in my closet, I can't look him in the eyes and say, yeah, you, you should let me dine. It's where we start to get real with ourselves and we start to understand, you know what? I, I, I'm a mess and I, I, need, I need Jesus. And that's why 2,000 years ago, God sent us Jesus. He sent us a Savior so that Jesus could live the perfect life and die the death in our place. So now God is saying, now I don't have to judge you. I don't have to judge you based on the way that you have lived your life. I'm going to judge you based on the way Jesus has lived his life, his perfect life, because he died in your place, and now I can do that. Now, the invitation is clear, but you have to accept 
the fulfillment of that invitation, which is Jesus. Will you believe in Jesus? Will you cling to Jesus? Will you joyfully cling to Jesus, seeing how incredible it is that we're invited? That we're invited. And if you do that, then the Bible promises that you will dine at His table and you will spend the rest of your life for eternity, forever and ever, seated at the table with God. Now, I I don't know where you are at today. I don't know what your reasons may be not to accept this invitation because we have so many excuses, so many reasons. You know, the Bible is fallible. It's not even real. It, you know, that, that Jesus character, he, he didn't exist, let alone give this, this message here. But these are all excuses. And sometimes we, we believe these excuses because we make them sound so good to us. But the, at the end of the day, all those excuses are going to do are make the master angry. Because he's going to see those things and say, I wish you would have just accepted the invitation. Today, don't leave here without accepting that invitation. If you've never come to know the Lord, don't leave here without asking somebody, talking to somebody that you came with or myself or Pastor Dean or one of the elders or deacons and get more information. We're talking about eternity here. We're talking about after you die, this 80-year span, living for millions and millions of years, and how you respond to the invitation will determine if you will spend the rest of eternity with God or apart from God. Please don't leave here today without getting more information on it. And I pray that, that you would receive that invitation, receive Jesus if you haven't already. Thank you.